Um, so we're going to start our next panel, and our next moderator is one of Mittler's very own. Uh, he is currently an assistant clinical professor of law at Vanderbilt University, my alma mater. Uh, prior to that, he was a clinical fellow right here at the University of Michigan Law School, where he ran the school's entrepreneurship clinic and focused on intellectual property. Professor Hans joined the Vanderbilt University faculty in the summer of 2018, helping to launch a First Amendment clinic. His work focuses more broadly on the intersection of uh, technology and civil liberties issues. Professor Hans has played an instrumental role uh, in Mittler's history. He was editor-in-chief of volume 17 of Mittler. Uh, and when Sophie and I took a hold of the wheel in 2018, we were very sad to see him go. Uh, but we are thrilled to have him back, and I'll let him take it from here. Great. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel of experts who uh, will be briefly presenting some slides and talking about their particular areas of interest. Having reviewed the slides, I am really um, just blown away by the level of expertise we have on this panel, um, which you can read in the program. So I won't go into detailed bios, but I um, will introduce from the far left, let me make sure we get my names right, um, Richard Berner from NYU, then we have uh, Marvin Amori, then Sharon O'Halloran, and Melissa Coity. So, I think we'll, as I mentioned, do brief discussions of slides. Um, I'll sort of moderate a conversation amongst the panelists and then turn it over to questions. And we will, um, in, as a former editor-in-chief of MTLR and having done our symposium, we will finish this panel at 2.45 and be on time. Um, but I will make sure that we have plenty of time for questions as well. Great. So I think we'll begin. Okay. Thank you. So I have more slides than I can get through today, but um, I will... Uh, try to frame some of the issues that I think are important for this topic, which is designing responsible fintech data practices and regulations. That's actually two topics co-joined, but certainly related to one another. Um, and my, I'm going I'm to argue, and maybe somewhat controversially, that fintech isn't so special. Um, it obviously has special characteristics, but we need to pay attention to sort of back to basic principles when we think about regulation and we think about data practices, because they apply across the board. Question is, what are data, uh, the best practices for data management? I think Christie's talk was a great setup for that and talking about data hygiene. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about why financial regulation. Maybe that's obvious to everybody here, so I can skip through it pretty quickly. Um, challenges for regulating fintech. Again, I can't get to all of those, but I'll hit some of the highlights. And last but not least, I'll give you a list of hot topics, and if you want more, come see me. Um, obviously, <coughs> The promise of big data, as Christie's talk amply illustrated, and combined with new te technology is huge. The question is, will that promise be kept? Um, and so uh, one of my favorite papers in this regard is Andy Haldane's. Here's a quote from Andy. Data, ha as everybody knows, has become the new oil. Data companies have become the new oil giants. But two big caveats. One from the chair of the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Big data, however, is of little use to anybody and unless it can be cleaned, organized, standardized, and made sense of. In other words, if you don't have hygiene across the board, um, you have nothing, basically. Um, and another from my former colleague at the Treasury, Amaya Garrity, um, who is now in fintech, fintech startup land, which is that you know we tend to focus in fintech a lot on shiny objects. Instead, we ought to solve. We ought to think about what what problems are we trying to solve. Um, and not just apply innovative technology. So the questions come first. The technology and picking the right tool for the job is obviously important. It's very important, I think, implicit in what Christy said, to think about data um, as an asset. And what do we mean by that? Well, data are foundational assets for all, not just for the consumer, not just for the business, but also for society and for the people who regulate um, uh, the, and set standards for uh, us in society. Therefore, data standards management and governance are essential. And I think Sharon's question is really critical in that regard, and I'll get to that uh, in a bit. <clears throat> Three aspects of this, I think, matter. The first is quality. We implicitly have been talking about that. Um, I think there's a narrative uh, in the big tech community that we don't really need standards because, uh, after all, these wonderful tools can just go in and uh, and parse through the data and find all the things that we need. I think nothing um, uh, that the opposite is actually true. 
The use of technology and big data actually require more standardization, more governance, um, and more structure. That's not to say we can't observe patterns from unstructured data. We can. But ultimately, when we're trying to be accountable and transparent, we're going to need standards to do that. We need to decide what data we need in order to answer the questions, the business problems, the consumer problems that are out there, and make, the sh make sure that the data that we have are fit for purpose. And by the way, that also means that we shouldn't be uh, collecting or using data that we don't actually need. And we need to figure out, and we've been talking about this, how to make data more accessible, how to do it securely, how to do it with privacy. There are financial data exchange standards that are being set up. Um, you know, these all sound good, and I think some of them are very good. Uh, but that accessibility problem is a huge problem. You might be surprised to learn that it's a huge problem within government. Government agencies do not share data among themselves. And that's partly because they don't know how to do it securely. But we're trying to figure that out and trying to do it so that we reduce duplication and collecting data that aren't needed. And that brings me to the last point, which is we need to streamline and standardize uh, regulatory reporting uh, and to stop unneeded collection. That's going to be a win-win for the regulators and for business. Uh, and if we focus on the things that we really need, we're going to have a better regulatory and supervisory process. Business models will be more efficient. And all those compliance burdens that are mounting on companies like Christie's and others in this room, uh, I think, will be reduced. So I'll quickly run through some of the uh, ideas behind data management and governance, which I think are critical for any enterprise. You have to have a data management strategy. You have to have a data governance program. I can talk about what the details of that look like. You have to have clear boundaries of roles, but strong collaboration and communication channels. In other words, you have to weave data hygiene across the enterprise. You have to have an end-to-end -end process for establishing data lineage. Where do the data come from? What are they going to be used for? Where do they go? Do we actually get rid of the data? When a consumer says, I want to opt out, I want to have the right to be forgotten, what does that mean? Do you keep the data? Do you actually forget them? How does that work? We need to develop uh, <clears throat> maintenance of drill down uh, uh, data catalogs. Um, the metadata, that's a jargon word for data about data, um, are essential in thinking about data management. You need to have the characteristics of the data. You need to understand where they are. They need to be made accessible. And they need to relate to one another. That's the purpose of metadata. You need to have ease of accessibility and search uh, in those metadata uh, and detailed data element dictionaries for data end users. Data are of no use if I can't find them, if I don't know what they stand for, they don't know what they describe. So that's uh, important. And then last, in an enterprise, you need to have a culture of a need to share data. There are some principles. We can talk more about that. Uh, but uh, that's, that's really it in a nutshell. Now, Sharon raised the question of standardization. And I spent seven years working on this, or more. Um, one kind of uh, standardization relates to identification of entities. In other words, how do you identify a business? Is it J.P. Morgan and Company? Is it J.P. Morgan Inc.? Is it something else? Is it Morgan Guarantee Trust Company of New York, which I used to work for, the old identifier for that? Uh, entity? Is it one of the 3,200 legal entities that exist within J.P. Morgan? The answer is all of the above. Uh, and so having an entity identification system is pretty important. The legal entity uh, is a good place to start, and the LEI, or legal entity identifier, is a data standards building block, which is important. Remember when Lehman failed? People didn't know they were exposed to Lehman Brothers because they didn't know how to identify the subs as being affiliated with, Legan, with, with Lehman. The LEI is a unique uh, ID. We think of it like a barcode to precisely identify parties to a financial transaction. It's now in use. We started it. Now there are more than uh, a million and a half of them. Um, we probably need three million or more of them around the world. And that's just really scratching the surface. But this is a good start to be able to precisely identify people. And they need to be maintained. The good thing about the LEI is when two companies merge with each other, the LEI doesn't die, but characteristics associated with it get added on to the LEI so you can figure out, okay, this is now a part of a different company because 
uh, it got merged. It helps financial regulators and it helps firms really understand what the exposures are from firm to firm um, and the transmission across, risk transmission across the financial system. And very importantly, industry has long maintained and believed that use of these identifiers will reduce their costs, uh, both for reporting, for risk management, for compliance, collecting, cleaning, aggregating, and reporting data. This sounds like a win-win, right? Everybody should want one or more than one. In fact, we have to cajole people. We have to remind people. We have to persuade them. ISDA, which governs uh, derivatives regulation, immediate attention. It's time to obtain a legal entity identifier. This thing's been around for almost 10 years. Well, why hasn't it happened? It's because people want to do things in the way that they have done it. It sounds like a no-brainer to do this. But solving this collective action problem is really hard because it means retooling your systems. It means really redoing what you have. The good news is you can map these things one into the other. You don't need to replace them. Um, if you want to read more about this, Kate Judge at Columbia and I uh, have written a paper called the Data Standardization Challenge. It's an SSRN paper out there. Take a look. Happy to answer questions about that. All right, switching gears. What about financial regulation? That may, there are a bunch of lawyers in the room, it may seem obvious why we need financial regulation. But let's start with the basics. We have market failure. We get a divergence between private and social costs and benefits. We need to protect some people. We need to protect consumers. We need to protect investors. We need to assure that markets are fair and effective where trust can be built uh, and acted upon. And we need to safeguard financial stability. So those are all important things. Now there are many types of financial regulation. The first bucket protects um, or attends to market, markets, investors, and consumers. Well-functioning, efficient markets, integrity, transparency, competitiveness, resilience, all those things uh, we've heard about uh, a little bit in this session. And we need to protect investors, um, including how things are represented to them um, and what the security of their information is and their privacy. But there's also very important regulation that protects uh, our financial institutions and makes sure that they are safety and sound. We call that microprudential. Um, and that reduces their chance of failure, um, which means that you can trust that they're going to be around. And the last is macroprudential, which is relatively new. And that's to safeguard the financial system as a whole. There we want to try to identify, monitor, uh, and act on or mitigate threats to financial stability. We want to limit the adverse effects on the system um, from a shock uh, and therefore on the economy uh, if a crisis occurs. And we need to promote market discipline. What that means is we need to reduce too big to fail. We need to use market incentives and harness them uh, in order to get uh, people to do the right thing. We want to end the burden, the potential burden on the taxpayer uh, if a large complex financial institution uh, fails. So now what's so special about fintech? Well, there are some special things we need to pay attention to. For one thing, it's fast. For another thing, it's footloose. It knows no borders. Implicitly, that's been woven into our discussion today. It's also, or it can be, opaque. That's very important. Now, Christy talked about transparency. But opacity is sometimes the friend of fintech companies. The article that she pointed out in the Wall Street Journal that appeared yesterday is just a great example of that. But there are more. There are dozens and dozens uh, of where people benefit from opacity, but maybe to the detriment of, of others. And frankly, some uh, fintech practices are aimed at circumventing uh, regulation. So there are clearly benefits and costs to fintech. The benefits you all know about. Reduces information costs. And I'll flip through that quickly. <clears throat> Reduces transaction costs. And I'll flip through that quickly. It improves speed and efficiency. Um, and I'll flip through that quickly because I want to get to the costs. Well, the opacity can result in flim flam. It can result in risks moving into the shadows. And that's, just, that's not just important for regulators. If I'm running a business, I need to know who I'm transacting with. 
I need to know what my exposure to them is. I need to know whether they're going to make good on the promises that they've made to me. Those are all really important. And risks may become concentrated. Think about the size of Ant Financial. I mean, we don't think about this here in the United States that much, but the four largest banks in the world are Chinese. Ant Financial is a huge financial company, much bigger than most of ours. And so that concentration means there might be a lot of risk uh, in that company. So what should be our goals for a fintech regulatory framework? Well, we should have what I call and what Tom Curry, ex-controller uh, of the currency, calls when he put this out, responsible innovation. Because we want to promote innovation. So he um, uh, helped put out a, wh a white paper at the OCC which basically said, look, we want to meet the evolving needs of customers, uh, of consumers, businesses, and companies in a way uh, that meets those needs. But it's consistent with sound risk management, in other words, the microprudential goal. And it's also aligned with the bank's overall business strategy. And I would add to that, and sustaining market and financial system resilience. Those things are really important. So there are a number of challenges out there to do that. We need flexibility in doing this, and we need continuous updating. Innovation is constant, changes day to day. We need to constantly calibrate whether or not our regulations and whether w the way we, we look at fintech is uh, commensurate with those, um, those changes. We do, unfortunately, have a static legal regulatory framework, but the industry is constantly changing. Then we need to think about what and how to regulate. Those are pretty important questions. Do we regulate existing institutions or do we regulate financial instruments uh, or both? Um, I think we need to do both. We need to, de to detect, to monitor, to assess, to designate perhaps, to regulate and to supervise. That's traditional financial regulation. One way of thinking about this is to treat fintech startups like we do pharmaceutical companies. So we need to have probably limited use and control test environment. I'm sure you've all heard about clinical trials. There's a way to do that. We might have a, a broader expanse, restricted use by licensed experts, right? And so that makes some sense because we have sophisticated people who know what they're doing and what they're getting into and the risks they're taking. And then unlimited use by the public for the things that have the lowest bucket of, uh, of risk. That's one way to maybe parse the kinds of things that we're worried about here. Importantly, we need to have accountability when we think about regulation as well. Who's going to be in charge? In the United States, we have a very fragmented regulatory framework with overlapping responsibilities. And some of them extend to global jurisdictions. The question I asked of Michael Barr earlier related to that. How do we deal with, these, uh, with this global overlap? This is not my chart. This is from uh, the GAO, the, the uh, uh, Government Accountability Office, which basically graphically describes what our regulatory structure looks like in the United States. Across the top, you can see um, all the regulators, and there are many. And along the bottom, you can see those buckets of industry that are regulated. And they are overlapping. And they need to be. Now, does that mean we should rip it up and start over and have one regulator? We're not going to do that. What we need to do is to have better coordination and collaboration and communication among the regulatory agencies so that they can pursue common goals. I'll leave you with just some hot topics to think about, and there are a few. How do we regulate digital assets? How do we regulate mobile payments? How do we think about operational and cybersecurity risks? How do we think about compliance and uh, mitigating and dealing with financial crime? How do we think about the application of new technologies for these processes and so what we're calling reg tech, soup tech, risk tech, and insure tech, and on and on? <clears throat> what uh, should we do and why should we do it and how should we do it uh, with the prom promotion of those clinical trials and what we call regulatory sandboxes? How do we think about guarding against some of the things that Christy talked about, the biases in artificial intelligence and what I would broadly call model risk? How do we coordinate across borders? Those are all big questions that maybe we can talk about in the Q&A. 
So a couple of takeaways. Regulation is needed. FinTech does pose some special challenges. Many of those are just, you know, old wine and new bottles. Um, but some are genuinely new and require controlled testing. Thanks. it just a little bit different and I want to just think about how we can actually understand the impact that uh, using these different technologies sort of the different tools AI data science and so forth what does that mean for uh, the different types of regulations that we can have and what does that mean for regulating fintech in particular so I always want to start off with, because people very get confused, like, what is fintech? And I, I think it's just, once you state it, we'll understand that there is a difference, and it has different properties, and that it's just to improve the, autom the automation and delivery of financial services. And now there's reg tech, and there's lots of other techs that fall within similar types of buckets, but you can just see there. Now, why does this matter? Why should we be spending a lot of time on this? This is just a notion of how much money is going into there, and you can just see this nice upward trend. But most important, it's a growing part of the, of the financial intermediation infrastructure. That is, it, people are moving their money there, they're doing basic types of business decisions there, banking decisions, payment decisions, a la PayPal, thank you, which I use quite often, and that it's becoming an important part of, of the infrastructure for financial sector. Why is finance or FinTech different? Well, it really, this, this is three issues here. It's, it has heterogeneous entities that are in disparate locations that own the data. There's a low trust environment and there's a lack of transparency makes verification and maintaining an audit trail difficult, all right? So those are the issues that it faces. And so the questions are, can we impose the same types of regulations then that we have in normal financial institutions and services into this space? Now the regulations that we usually see, especially those after the crisis, really imposed uh, a series of, um, I would say, mostly microprudential regulations with some implications for macroprudential regulations that focused on issues of transparency and flexible analysis with imposing capital requirements, leverage requirements, and so on. The question is, can we impose those too on these fintech type firms? Now, this is what the structure that that was being talked about here, where you have, say, just take a, a normal bank structure, and you have a bank that's regulated at the microprudential level, that is, again, the capital requirements, leverage requir ratios, and so on, and then that gets fed up to looking at the macroprudential level, which would be notions of systemic risk, and the question is, to what extent can we think about the regulations and the relationship between those two, and how can data science in particular, or artificial intelligence, how can they help us in thinking about the regulation in this area in a space like fintech that doesn't necessarily follow this type of, diff of, of uh, structure, of organizational structure. And here, what we're looking at then is the notion that you can use a number of different types of things. You can use sampling data, right, from derived from real distributions, that's right. You can uh, simulations, you can use computational analytics, and use data visualization tools. 
These then become the tools or the workhorses for us to be able to use the, and the data from what we can derive from these fintech firms and then apply them to understand and apply different types of regulations and to see what regulations work and what their effects are. Okay. So these new, a new AI technologies provide new tools in which we can start regulating. Now, these new tools actually are slightly different than the way we've previously regulated. They tend to be uh, more transparent. They tend to be collaborative. And they actually have really worked out and been functioning within the space where academics, industry, and regulators come together. So it's a different set of tools than you usually see. And these tools include machine learning, NLP, deep learning, uh, neural nets. So this is not an app or something that you can build in your garage. So this is something distinct, okay? And so the approach that we've been taking, and this is um, out of uh, the FinTech lab at Columbia University, has been through the development of a risk dashboard and using open source risk analytics. And this is going to allow you to test the implications of different regulations in different type of in, uh, financial spaces. It's cloud-based, it enables risk analytics, um, across different portfolios, asset classes, and so forth. It fe features, again, open source, collaborative, with a shared set of standards. Now, I, I don't want to go through too much of the risk analytics stuff, but given that basic model, you can see how you can build uh, a basic workhorse of a firm or any types of aggregations, again, from the micro level, aggregating all the way up, and then building out a system and the way in which there's interactions between that. Uh, the, these, the benefits of this, that once you do this, it provides independent benchmarking, improved transparency, connectivity, and so forth. And just to, so that you could see where regulation would come into this, is that this would be where your data inputs take place, where there'd be um, different types of form of calibration of a particular model, where you'd then have simulations that would take place, where you'd have an aggregations of those, and then you'd have a set of outputs. Each of those points of those arrows becomes points where you would actually introduce regulation. You could introduce regulation on what types of the structure of the data they are, how those model calibrations go, so that's model risk, right? What are, the, what are the simulations that you need? This is a stress test testing. Uh, what the outputs are, these are all the different types of um, reporting requirements that are needed, and then how they get uh, interacted and pushed out to your regulators, okay? So all of a sudden, what you have when you look at something like this is a tool in which businesses that don't usually have a means in which to interact with regulators or meet the standards of regulators can do so in a standardized way that meets a set of regulations that are predefined. Okay. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go through all the, the, lore, the gory detail, but if anybody wants to go into the bowels of this, I, I'm happy to spend hours. But this will, what it does, it'll put out a series of simulations, so it's called synthetic data, of which you, they're built off of real distributions of any financial institution. And then you can go ahead and s simulate off of that. Um, this then provides us with a way to go ahead and do, so this is their, in, it's a nice visual analytics. You can do drill downs, you can do all of these into netting sets. I just is for a bank. You can do all the counterparties. You can go ahead and find where you're breaching. So I'm going to tell you if you want to go to the FinTech lab, Everything is there, it's all open source, so if you want, go ahead, you can click on the GitHub link, knock yourself out, download your 400,000 lines of C++ code and knock yourself out, go ahead. And um, what you can see is that this enables you to do scenario testing on the impact of alternative regulations so either, like in this case, we're looking at systemic risk or a particular regulation of collateralization. 
Now, you can do in your sand, this is like, this is different than a sandbox because this allows you actually to have the structure of a model or, the, or a firm already that's doing its business, if you will. We build out the interactions, how it interacts with its parties, so you can build out, in this case, we're building out a financial firm of banks, but you could have PayPal interacting with its B2Bs or PayPal interacting with a set of customers, and you can look at the types of risk analytics that it comes out and the risk that it pushes out, the risk that it gets in, and then you could do an intervention. Suppose that we ha you had to, if you enter into a contract, you had to collateralize, you had to put money aside, and, we put, and that's the regulation. Well, what would that mean for aggregate risk, for the system as a whole, the market as a whole, and then for the individual ca counterparties or entities within that transaction? And then you can come up, and I'm not, this, I have papers, I'm not, I'm not going to show the results here, that, but you, you come up with those types of results. Now, you can do this for any type of regulation or any type of intervention that you're interested in, and the beauty of it is, is that you get to see the impact of an in, a regulation or a different type of standard encoding or a different type of requirement or whether you allow um, only sophisticated investors or only certain types or certain type of instruments to be allowed to happen before you actually implement that regulation. Now, that's actually amazing because if you look at Janet Yellen, when she was talking about whether we should introduce the notion of clearing houses, she went through a very lovely speech. She showed all this information about why clearing houses might be good. She showed a nice, actually, figure of why this, she thinks it might be good. And very honestly, as in her beautiful way of doing it says, well, we don't have all of the information to show that, in fact, it will improve the system, but we think it does, and so it's worth trying. Now, having gone now, since this is something that we're working on right now, if you actually build out a model, a graph, that mathematical model, and you do this right now, and you look at the difference between if you allow counterparty, so I'm giving you my my early research ahead of time, and I'm going to give you my, my uh, why you should actually want to do this. And then you actually allow all the hedges to go into it, and you ask, are there benefits to the netting? And that's always the question, right? And the answer is, well, yes, and under some very obvious situations, but moreover, you're winding up doubling the risk in the system by having the potential of the, of the clear, by forcing the clearing. So we're not talking minor uh, differences, we're talking major differences. And so I can estimate that, I can show it mathematically, and I can estimate that, and I can simulate that. And that's the kind of work you really want to do before you say everyone has to go on to clearing. Um, that's, that's all, and on the collateralization, regulation, which we have published, what we show there is that, yes, by imposing collateralization, as you might anticipate, you reduce the cost of resolution. That, that would be true. But you don't necessarily reduce the risk in the system, right? You've just moved it around. And that's it. And so have you made the system safer? Well, it, that's a question. So those are, the, those are the types of things that you have to really think about hard, and you have to ask yourself, and this was your point, is that regulation fit for purpose? And you can't answer that question unless you've done something like this and have a tool for that. And if we're talking about a fintech space where it has all of those different types of problems that needs, as you were quite, a fast regulatory response, that can understand the impact that with changing partners and entities with different types of response functions to markets, correct, that you need to sim, you won't have a lot of data, market data, you'll have some market data, so you need to simulate or impute what you think is gonna happen, and then you wanna understand, I intervene this way, what would be the effect, the predicted effect, that you need something like this to make good estimates 
about what a regulation, what regulations are best, under what conditions. That's the punchline. Okay, so <laughs> that's it. Um, it allows you to do that. I, you know, I think it's something that we should be doing. It's absolutely necessary doing. FinTech makes it even more important. The consequences are big and the costs are um, even bigger. Thanks. There, okay. <laughs> it's like, thank you. Wow, we've gone big, big, global, uh, lots of data. We've gone narrow, somewhat in the US. We've gone markets, relevance of data and how we regulate in the market space. And now we're gonna go really small again. Um, but I hope you'll uh, find this relatable and useful. So I'm Melissa Coity. I have to figure out if I have to put my glasses on to see the screen or not. I probably do, yep. Um, I am here to talk to you about a, what we like to call a startup, although we're a year old now. Um, but we are a startup research organization, FinReg Lab, and it's probably helpful and maybe somewhat interesting to hear a little bit of the context of the creation of this startup research organization. Um, I sat in the U.S. Treasury Department, not quite down the hall from Dick, uh, but in the Obama administration, and I led the Office of Consumer Policy. And part of that office's responsibility was really trying to get our heads and our insights around the burgeoning, growing uh, use of data in the financial system, especially on the retail side of financial services for consumers and small businesses, and also these emerging technology applications. Uh, virtual currency is what we referred to, crypto, uh, blockchain, uh, different types of not only the currency but actually the technology underneath, but that was hitting our desk in 2011. And so my office's responsibility was trying to get our heads around what are these technologies, what are these data applications, how do they work, and really importantly, what does that mean for policy positions that we, the Treasury Department, would be taking with our colleagues who are the regulators, but also with uh, legislative offices and staffs. Um, we made a couple of trips out to California sat on Google's nice warm toilet seats. Uh, you know, it was quite the fun uh, learning experiences. But some really interesting uh, conversations at PayPal too about data. So I left Treasury at the end of the Obama administration um, and realized that while sitting at Treasury for four and a half years, there was one thing that we desperately needed when it came to thinking about how are we contemplating evolution of laws, evolution of policy, so that we make sure consumers are protected, that our financial institutions are safe, that our financial system is safe overall, what we desperately needed was not just to hear from the hundreds upon hundreds of advocates, not just the consumer advocates, but the merchants, the large banks, the incumbents who would come in the door and tell us about, you know, the use of data is going to be uh, the end of the world when it comes to privacy or the next best thing next to sliced bread when it comes to financial services. What we really needed were some fact-based insights where there was real analysis and testing of the use of data and these new technologies by an independent organization that could do the research and frankly that could do the research in a timely fashion and could do it in a way that had some understanding of what was really the heart of the questions that we needed to answer as policymakers and regulators. So anyway, that's the background, but so you have a context of what you're about to hear that we're doing now. So FinReg Lab, Lab was stood up a year ago. We are a nonprofit organization, and we are setting out to very ambitiously, but also very 
uh, intentionally identify what are those pressing questions as it relates to the use of data in financial services and how can we build tests and research that ultimately are gonna answer those questions, but not just for the regulators, but frankly, for the broader financial ecosystem, because when it comes to new legislation, you better believe all those hundreds of advocates are going to have a point of view and a perspective on this. So that's the context. Now let me figure out how I work this thing. Probably just talk you through. So this is what we do. Um, we engage directly with regulators and policymakers, as well as the broader community to identify these areas of research that we will undertake. We function as this honest broker intermediary between industry, who frankly, when they're using data in new ways or technologies, really want to get close to the regulators to help the regulators understand how that technology works. But there are some spaces where there is regulatory uncertainty or there are anxieties about competitive implications of sharing uh, really nuanced data and information. At the same time, the regulators also would love to get closer, but frankly, there's also a little bit of an anxiety among regulators. If we bring these entities that may be doing something that doesn't quite work with the laws that we have in place, do we regulators end up sitting in a position where we have some responsibility for something that actually may not, that may create some harm for consumers or customers. And so we're able to be this honest broker that sits in between and can put together these types of experiments to generate the insights and then present the insights to the broader community and to facilitate a conversation about then what do these implications of the data use or the technology use, what do they, move, what do they mean for policy and really push a conversation, facilitate a discussion so that we're coming up with policy options. And so that's what this largely reflects. So I'm gonna keep going. I know we're running a little late on time, so I wanna to get to what are we actually looking at uh, right now. So let me ask you this question just to kick us off and to get you all moving a little bit. Uh, Stay seated if you, well, stand up if you would be willing to allow a lender to look at your bank account data and it may generate a better price or you may actually get access to credit where you otherwise would not have. Would you, just stand up so you just get yourself moving for a minute, would you be willing to have a lender look at what's in your account? I have no idea, by the way, what you all are going to do. I'm, this is the first time I've done this. <laughs> but it's helpful. <laughs> so it was almost like half, right? A little bit. So in the US, we actually have almost 50 million people who either lack a sufficient credit history or lack any credit history at all. And thus, they are challenged to get access to credit. Lots of different types of credit, but they're highly challenged. We also have another 23 million sole proprietors, small businesses in this country who would like to get access to credit, but who struggle to get it because they're new to the business, uh, building a business. There is a theory that cash flow data, information that's in that bank account, could actually be quite predictive and enabling lenders to assess those individuals and those small businesses to determine if they actually can take on credit and pay it back. To get to the punchline a little bit, and what you see here is actually a variety of different type of data, sort of the here and the now, then the potential data that's frankly on the horizon. I would argue some of this is actually in some fashion making its way into who's getting credit already, somewhat on the marketing side, but what we're talking about now is actually what are the data that are making their way into the underwriting decisions. What we decided to do, because it has implications not just for fintech, frankly, fintechs are a small portion. Yes, the investment dollars are vast and growing, but this also has implications for banks. And our system is by and large built on a banking system, our access to credit. And these questions of cash flow data may have real relevance, not just for the ability of fintechs to lend to consumers and small businesses, but also banks. 
It's also one of the less scary types of data that may actually be useful for predicting credit risk. And so what we are doing right now is we are engaged with a number of lenders who are sharing with us loan level information. These are lenders that are using cash flow data in their underwriting process. But they're allowing us to take that data in on a firm by firm basis and evaluate borrowers that they're lending to with performance data and comparing borrowers who are underwritten with cash flow in it compared to similarly situated borrowers where you don't use cash flow, where we're using a more traditional FICO or FICO-like score. Here are the companies who are participating with us. There are actually two more that aren't up there yet. And so to bring this back to the policy question, what are the implications of this? Well, first of all, guess what? Our rules regarding and our law regarding what data is used in underwriting are focused on credit history data. So the idea of even using new data like cash flow, it's not prohibited, but we don't have a law, an ecosystem that thinks about how are we making sure that when new types of data like cash flow are brought into underwriting, that consumers are protected, that there are privacy expectations, that there's clarity around transparency, and that data is accurate. Because what we're talking about, and I don't have this map up there, but is a very different ecosystem where data <coughs> is sitting with the banks, it's ultimately flowing to the lenders, it is required or requested by consumers, but the method by which that data flows is typically through new intermediaries called data aggregators, which we've talked about a little bit. But we have a lot of important questions around what are those protections? How do we think about the laws and the regulations evolving so that consumers do have those protections? And then there are a host of other very important laws and uh, I would say societal expectations around using new data. So the core questions that we're seeking to answer through this experiment that we're doing as well as the policy process discussion is how does that data actually, does it accurately enable a lender to separate risk, goods from bads? How do those consumers and those small businesses form? That tells us was the data uh, effective? Do those uh, underwritten with it, do they perform better? And then a really important question that we're not diving into today, but it was alluded to or spoken to somewhat by Michael this morning, and it's on everybody's minds in the uh, credit underwriting space. Do we see differences in outcomes between protected classes and white men? So the work that we're doing actually has built out two months of working group to actually probe what are the policy options when it comes to fair lending expectations and those ecosystem protections. And importantly, there are questions that practically need to be resolved um, because we have expectations that when there is information that results in an adverse action, meaning I thought I was going to get credit at a certain price and the price is different, or I was denied when I thought I was going to get it, that actually has to be communicated to that potential borrower. And so they're just practicalities of how do you explain to somebody, well, it was what was in your bank account and you didn't have enough of an average balance over the past six months. Uh, those are new types of information that lenders would say are challenging to explain under the norms by which that information is shared today. And then importantly, how are we really making sure that consumers, it's where we've been spending a lot of time today, that they know what they're consenting to in terms of the use of this data and its um, use by these lenders as it flows through these intermediaries, these data aggregators. So I am going to leave you with, these are some of the subtopics under each of these areas. Um, I'm gonna skip this too, because we really are almost out of time. These are data flows, data maps to actually look at and understand how the data is making its way through the system. I'm happy to make these slides available to everybody. We are about to release the report in April and it is going to actually provide those fact-based insights or answers to is the data predictive. 
and also identify what are the policy and the regulatory options. Because if this data, as we hypothesize, is predictive and useful, this could be a really valuable data source for extending credit to borrowers who otherwise may not get it or who might be priced differently. But that will require that policymakers and all the advocates that I talked about at the start really understand what the implications of the data are and are bought into the idea that we are bringing in new type of data into financial decisioning, in this case, underwriting. So I will make sure the report gets to Michael and others and out the door. But I uh, look forward to your questions. Okay. Um, thank you. It's such an honor to be on, on, on a panel like this. Uh, I've already learned a lot, and it's always great to be back at Michigan, where I did my undergrad, as did four of my siblings. So, uh, so it's home. Um, the, the problem I, I was sort of thinking of uh, to talk about um, is, one, we read about it all the time where some giant company has your data and it got stolen. So now your social security number and a bunch of other data is in the, hand of, in the hands of some Russian or Chinese hackers because you trusted some central entity to control your data. And this, this happens all the time. Uh, you have to do a credit freeze. It happens to me occasionally with these giant companies. I think it's Marriott, TJ Maxx. There's just been a string of them who have your data because you, you trust them with it uh, to get your services and then they get hacked or lose it. The, uh, similarly, I mean, when I think of where a lot of my data is, a lot of my data is on Facebook, for example, uh, and I know that I can go around the internet and log in with Facebook. Right? You guys do this occasionally, where instead of creating a new you, login, you, you just log in with Facebook or log in with Google or log in with Twitter, and what's going on there is that website might not want to manage your identity uh, information, and uh, Facebook has it, and Facebook can authorize them to access certain information they need, like your age if you're over 18, uh, your name, some photos, out of the Facebook database into this new website's database. Uh, and then when later you want to deauthorize that access, you can deauthorize that access and it would no longer be available to that company. And if you want to create a competitor to Facebook or some other one of these giants, it's pretty hard to do it because all my data is on Facebook, all my friends' data is on Facebook. If I want to go move it somewhere else, it's, it's a giant pain. And when you think about the future of financial technology, a lot of it will be based on data, as, as we know. And if all of my banking and transactional data is in with one bank, and they're giving me all these awesome insights about how to like shop and save money or get things that I didn't realize I even needed, uh, um, I might stick with them because it might be too hard to, to move that data and that history to a new competitor that might have better services might, because they don't have that data. So a question of data portability and the question of just like hacking. And so I want to talk a little bit about a potential technological solution. Uh, the industry I work in is like cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, I will do my best not to use a bunch of buzzwords. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know much about blockchain, just, just think of it as an Excel document. Despite all the buzzwords, think of it as an Excel document that uh, a group of people kind of collectively maintains and trusts. Right? So you guys probably have heard of Bitcoin. How many of you own a little bit of Bitcoin? Yes, we got at least one hand, two, two hands, okay, great. So when Bitcoin was invented, some guy was like, gee, I hate the banks and governments. I want to invent new money. And he was like, what is money? Money isn't just like green paper that you carry around, right? If you were to buy a house, you, would, you wouldn't carry around bags of, of green paper. Money is nowadays pretty much electronic. It's an entry on a spreadsheet that says you have a certain amount of money. If I'm moving some money to Melissa. Her spreadsheet on her bank, will, the number will change. She'll get more, I'll get less. There's some magic in between, some bank financial magic, I don't understand, that updates those, those spreadsheets. That now means I have less money and she has more money. And 
Think of blockchain as just some non-bank computer cryptography magic in between to make sure that the spreadsheet is accurate, that now I have less Bitcoin and she has more not Bitcoin. And it could even be used for uh, dollars or anything else. Just think of it as a spreadsheet that everyone can trust without relying on banks or governments. Now, I spend most of my, my life in Microsoft Word. For people who spend their lives in like Excel or databases, they see databases everywhere. Databases, you know, for example, Facebook is just kind of this giant database of all of our information. And then they display it in different ways. And recently, Mark Zuckerberg was, was at Harvard Law School and he was interviewed by Jonathan Zittrain and he said, oh, I've been thinking about um, figuring out a way to do identity in the blockchain, where instead of everyone storing all their data on Facebook and people logging in through Facebook, you could instead store all your data on some database that no one owns and controls, not Facebook, not anyone. In the magic of the, of the computer, cryptography, et cetera, is a database everyone trusts. And when someone wants to go log in somewhere, then they could go and they could use their you know, keys to tell a website, hey, you're allowed to reveal to this website this amount of data. And then you could eventually deauthorize that data if you didn't want it. So you could have essentially Facebook login and all your data somewhere or bank login and all your bank data somewhere without trusting anything but technology. Um, now, um, so, so that, that's, that's the, the concept. And there are a few companies out there trying to do this. One's called Blockstack, one's called Civic, trying to do what they call decentralized identity. So just think of it as um, putting your data somewhere and not having to trust any of these entities that can be regulated. Right? So rather than relying on some entity regulating it, make sure it's keeping your data secure in all these different ways, you could rely on public key cryptography and other things that, that can't be broken um, to know that your data is secure, to share that data with new fintech companies, and to permit a hopefully a competitive market where you're in charge of your data. So, so that's, um, that's the, the, the technology I wanted to talk about as a potential solution. And uh, unlike uh, some of the other folks on the, on the panel who um, I, I guess come from more of a regulatory background. I come from, uh, from an internet background. I worked on internet issues for about 20 years. And I remember when we passed all these laws to sort of make it legal to do things on the internet, like all these immunities around um, libel and uh, copyright. Uh, and you know, when I, I come from a world where the idea of, of like something like pharma for fintech it is, you know, it made my soul hurt to think that you would go to some government bureaucrat, you know, some, some like agency stocked with terrible engineers and software developers and ask them for permission to start your company and go through all these trials. To me, to me, just makes me, it makes me want to puke. But I get that you were throwing out just one idea. Um, uh, and I appreciated that. And we're, so we're here to be controversial. Yeah, I, I figured I, I figured I'd spice it up. And so, for, so when I look at this issue, um, you know, these companies like Blockstack and all these companies that are trying to create decentralized identity uh, and some sort of way for you to control your own data, uh, they tend to rely on cryptocurrency in the background. Right? The same way that, you know, I don't, kind of, I don't really know what happens between me and the banks when I, when I transfer money to Melissa, there's a lot of uh, technological incentives designed to keep, to keep that database secure without any one person having to be trusted. You kind of incentivize a whole group of people through paying them a little bit of cryptocurrency to keep it secure. In, in, the, in the Bitcoin world, it's called Bitcoin mining, but just think of like there's some sort of incentive structure. Now, what I was gonna talk about is that we need to make sure that technologies like these can thrive, and we have a, a bunch of folks in DC who are well-meaning, but who don't understand the technology I'll just name one agency, like the Securities and Exchange Commission, which looks at most cryptocurrencies as securities and therefore uh, is doing a bunch of things that kind of chill the market and the innovation that's possible. So that's all, that's all I wanted to sort of put on the table, and then, and then we, we can talk about anything else. Um, rather than me ask questions, I think we should have audience questions because I think that'll probably elicit some of the themes that we've been talking about, that I've been thinking about, and certainly I think the rapid pace of change in this area has really been, um, uh, I think, a common theme and, and how we address that it remains to be a challenge. But I think Sophie has the mic, so perhaps we'll just turn over to audience questions. Uh, 
my question is, uh, I know that blockchain's a huge consumer of electricity to uh, verify transactions, and if you're going to uh, put that out as verifying everybody's identity, what does that do for global warming? <laughs> folks, I'll, be, I'll answer it pretty quickly. Uh, Bitcoin is secured through something called proof of work, which does require a lot of electricity. There are new technologies coming on, such as proof of stake and other kinds of ways to do consensus that won't require a lot of electricity. Sure. Uh, it, it's still going to require um, lots of people doing lots of things, which are going to require energy in some form. Um, so I don't know exactly what the alternative you want is, but yes, in Germany where they have a lot of it is I think there's one a utility plant that's actually, they say is basically fun, is basically supporting all the miners. So yeah, it's actually a significant issue. And, in, and, one, of the, and one of the problems is, is that it's not clear that the utility bills are being offset by how much the miners are making. So there's a definite incentive thing there. So yes, there's been a lot of this uh, economic marginal return on it. So whether it's a viable economic model, I don't know, but we'll see. Just one quick point, and I agree with, with everything you said. If it's not viable for a, for a miner, they usually will stop uh, mining because they'll do something else. But you know, at the moment, we do. There's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions coming through lots of things on the internet and finance, you know, the bank buildings and cloud computing centers. So um, it's not a question. Uh, it's a question of sort of alternatives, right? Do you get the benefits that are worth the costs? Uh, not, not meaning to take us down another diversion down the road for blockchain here, but it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and let me just uh, say in the interest of full disclosure, I do think we need some regulation there um, because it is something that poses a lot of risks. I, I'm not so averse to, to, to having regulation there. But, but bringing things back to the privacy aspect for a second here. Um, the Bitcoin blockchain, the, as it is currently structured as a public blockchain, uh, has all of your personal information on it. And it, can, and it does not come off. That's the whole purpose behind uh, the, the, the blockchain itself. It's immutable, uh, which means you know, once your information is on there, it's on there. So I was, I was just wondering what the views of the panelists were uh, with respect to the risk that this represents to individual privacy and, and what approaches, if any, we should be taking in order to, to, to regulate this. Maybe I'll, I'll start with a couple. Um, one risk is operational risk in cybersecurity. Um, you know, the blockchain uh, acolytes think that you can't hack this stuff, but clearly as soon as you start trading on exchanges, um, you know, then that's a different problem. And there's no recourse. Uh, so that when an exchange is, when you lose money on an exchange, it's gone. It's just like losing currency on the street. Um, another um, regulatory issue relates to what I, I call digital assets. Um, and so, I think there's a lot of confusion about what the range of digital assets is. Marvin, uh, you know, has a an opinion which I respect, which is the SEC is not uh, equipped to deal with how to regulate these things. Um, maybe the lawyers in general aren't equipped to regulate these things. But, <laughs> but, the, but the point is, um, you know, we do have securities laws. We have laws that govern other kinds of financial assets. And actually, um, Part of our problem in our regulatory framework is that we have certain legal definitions for securities and for commodities. So certain crypto assets uh, are commodities, and the SEC doesn't regulate those. It's the CFTC. And certain are judged to be securities because they look, smell, feel, act like securities, um, like ICOs, initial coin offerings. Whether they are or they aren't um, probably will end up being decided in the courts. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to act like play play to be lawyer. But uh, you know, the SEC, on a preliminary basis, has decided that some ICOs are are securities. Um, you know, this is not settled law, and so there is a, an issue there. And the same principles that I talked about really are relevant for protecting <clears throat> not just consumers and businesses, but also for thinking about making our markets fair and effective, so that we we make sure there's trust in them. Um, also. Yeah, there are, the, are other technologies on, that are developing on privacy. I mean, 
that are probably much more innovative, uh, just because blockchain is actually quite slow. Just so uh, there, there's just many things about the blockchain in and of itself that is perfectly great for a distributive ledger. If you need, you know, issues around transparency, if you're in a low trust environment, and if you need to have an audit, a traceable audit. So those are sort of the, the and that's the environment. That's when you really want a blockchain. It, it's not. That's not all places. Correct. The other, the other issues like there's some really great weird sort of really innovative things such as encoding on DNA, synthetic DNAs um, or using metallic, uh, things that are actually probably much safer, uh, more secure, very fast, and um, higher in storage that probably have a much higher propensity to, to be storage information. So I think in the long term, blockchain and the distributive ledger were were a solution to a particular problem, and that's fine, but we shouldn't just try and keep trying to take blockchain and make it a solution to things that it was never set up to do. And it solves a problem, that it, and there may be certain applications and use cases, and that's fine under certain those types of circumstances, but, you know, that's fine. That's it. I'll just give a different point of view for a second, which is, um, so there are two different questions, two different things that came up. One was, uh, that the Bitcoin blockchain is very public in terms of all the transactions around there, not not names, sort of pseudonymous. You can track certain transactions, and there's already been um, multiple. The, the one that's sort of best known, Zcash, attempts to make private blockchains where you can transfer funds in a private way. And then in terms of um, you know immutability, uh, the, there are a lot of you know one of the strengths of blockchain is that it's there and it's auditable. Now. Um, in terms of other weaknesses when it comes to blockchain, you know, to me it's one tool among many, but uh, there are lots of attempts to make it faster, lots of investment and, and innovation in that space, not only the Ethereum blockchain, but you know, my company is called Protocol Labs. Our investors include Sequoia, which is the top venture capital firm, uh, you know, bar none, uh, Union Square Ventures, which um, invested in Twitter and Coinbase and others, uh, and Andreessen Horowitz, which is you know the top investment firm. These guys are investing pretty heavily in blockchain, uh, not because um, there's there's no, in our view there's no future, and there's lots of ways to adapt the technology. And uh, if you look at what the technology is doing today and where it is today, sure you might under misunderstand the promise and over-regulate it thinking there isn't enough benefit. That's kind of like in 1996, passing a law banning all the porn on the internet in a way that would have crippled the internet, which Congress tried to do, but luckily the Supreme Court struck it down. So had that law been upheld, the internet would probably have been regulated in a way where you had to show your 18 to go on websites because there are all these bad actors and porn on the internet. And if we treat the blockchain technology that way right now, um, I think you could really cripple what, what, what needs to be done. And so when it comes to the SEC, they might be right that there are lots of bad actors, but fraud is illegal. The FTC handles fraud when it comes to pre-selling software. The CFTC handles uh, fraud when it comes to commodities like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And there are lots of state laws against fraud. And so do you really need the disclosure, the disclosure regimen of the SEC when it comes to an open source software that's being used to power a network? Um, they've decided you don't when it comes to Bitcoin and Ethereum. And they've decided you might when it comes to all of the new innovative technologies coming after it. Uh, and they haven't even done that by rulemaking. They've done that through one uh, one director of one part of the agency giving one speech at the Yahoo Finance conference uh, in June of 2018, and a bunch of after the fact uh, enforcement actions without even the the shred of the the, the guidance that they were going to post on their website, which they haven't yet, or rulemaking. So I just think that's bad governance. And I, maybe I just pull that together and make uh, this tie into what Sharon talked about earlier, because. I really think, and I'm actually teaching a course in risk tech and reg tech, that the promise of using data appropriately and technology appropriately can be hugely beneficial uh, both to regulators and to the industry. Um, whether they're looking at a certain technology or not, whether they're looking at uh, a new financial product uh, that uses a different kind of technology, whether the distributed ledger technology is permissioned or permissionless. Um, in any case, uh, I think that um, the use of these technologies appropriately can not only foster um, a more streamlined regulatory process um, and a reduced regulatory burden, but also make the conversation between the regulators and those they regulate 
uh, much more effective and efficient. And that's where what Melissa is trying to do uh, really can come in and provide a safe harbor for having that conversation without having regulatory capture. So, so my sister's getting married today, and I have to be somewhere for photos. Um, and so we haven't finished on time, but I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I'm super honored to be on this panel. Thank you guys for everything. I apologize for running. So I think we'll leave it there in respect for the third panel. Thank you again, and thanks to our panelists.